Good morning. Lord, thank you for um, your name is beautiful, and I pray that we would uh, appreciate the, the power of, that your name represents all that you are. And I pray that today as we open your word together that you would accomplish its purpose and that we would be uh, confronted with the reality of Jesus and who he is in a way that uh, causes us to be more like him and to be more devoted to you through him and to walk in the power of your spirit and to fulfill your purposes for our life. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'd invite you to stand with me and let's read responsibly from the book of Revelation, chapter 6, verses 12 through 17. Then I saw him open the sixth seal. A violent earthquake occurred. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of hair. The entire moon became like blood. The sky was split apart like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the nobles, the generals, the rich, the powerful, and every slave and free person hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, because the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Amen. The Word of God. You may be seated. Let me just as a reminder and even as a disclaimer just give you perspective as we continue these weeks in looking at the book of Revelation and attempt to try to look at specific passages but then let us let them lead us to a broader perspective and a context of the book itself let me remind you that my fascination and my attraction to the Bible is based on a desire to glean from whatever I read in the Bible truth about who God is. In other words, the book of Revelation, for example. A lot of people are fascinated with the book of Revelation, and one of the reasons and one of the primary reasons for that fascination is a desire to you know, know what's coming, what's the end of the world going to be like. And <clears throat> I don't want to be judgmental but it's my observation that much of that interest is related to self-serving purposes you know I want to know this because I I'm, I may have to live through it and I want to know what's going to happen to me I think as we said earlier and if you if you weren't here I would encourage you to turn back to October the first Sunday of October and listen to a sermon from that Sunday wherein we talked about setting the, the table for the, for the approach to the book of Revelation is that the book of Revelation is no different than the other 65 books of the Bible. And according to Jesus, they're all about him in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Well, he tells us in the first five words of the book of Revelation, John tells us, that the book of Revelation is about Jesus as well. In fact, I would say it would be even more emphatically about Jesus than other books acknowledge. And so the idea being that my primary concern when I read any book of the Bible is what does this tell me about God? And I know about God primarily through the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah of Israel, 
and the Lord of the universe. And you say, well, how, is, that just, is that just an intellectual exercise? No, I would submit no. Because um, to paraphrase, and I stress paraphrase because I can't quote it verbatim, but A.W. Tozer in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, in the preface of that book, says to the effect, something to this effect, that there is an immutable law of the soul of humanity that whatever our concept of God is dictates how we view our life, the world, and our values and our actions. In other words, we imperceptibly behave consistent with our view of who God is or whatever our concept of God is. And he uses for purposes of illustration in that introduction, he uses for purposes of illustration the ancient Norse people when he talked about the fact that they were a, a, a warrior-like people. So it was no accident that they were that way because the primary god in their pantheon was Thor, the god of war. So therefore, they became a warrior people. So it seems to me that the better I know God, and I can only know God through Jesus Christ according to Jesus. So the more I increase my understanding of him and turn it into praise and prayer before him, as J.I. Packer says, that's the way I develop intimacy with him. And therefore, by default, the more I become like him and fulfill his will for my life to be conformed to his image. So as I approach the book of Revelation, I'm approaching it from that perspective. And today, as we look at 12 through 17 of chapter 6, there are three takeaways that impact me about the book of Revelation. And the first has to do with a seismological impact. Now, I'm told that a seismologist is a person who studies earthquakes. Is that your understanding? It is mine, too. And that's the extent of my knowledge of seismology I have just shared with you. But at the same time, I am intrigued by the fact that in the book of Revelation, <clears throat> that when we find the passages that describe the judgment of God being poured out, that there's always some kind of an earthquake connected to it. In other words, there's a corresponding impact on even the created world, the inanimate created world, when the judgment of God is poured out on sinful, unrepentant humanity. Compare that, if you will, to Matthew 27, verse 50 and following, but Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. Suddenly, the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked, and the rocks were split. The tombs also opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and they came out of the tombs after his resurrection, entered the holy city, and appeared to many. But notice the ultimate expression of the judgment of God for sin happened when Jesus died on the cross. And when, when he had satisfied his own wrath, as verse 17 of chapter 6 of Revelation just told us, when he had satisfied his own wrath, <coughs> so the wrath of God was being poured out for sin when Jesus was dying on the cross. And when that happened, there was an earthquake. Now, we're told that earthquakes have aftershocks. Many of you might have experienced that. Many of you may have lived in an earthquake zone and have had aftershocks. This morning in the first service, we had a friend of mine, a pastor from Iceland, was visiting with us, and they have volcanic activity and earthquakes quite frequently there. And he was very familiar with that concept. 
So these aftershocks are tremors that occur after the main event, so to speak, and the main earthquake goes away. But we also find out from people who study these things and tell us about them that there are such a thing as foreshocks, tremors that occur in advance of an earthquake that aren't as strong as the real thing but that's the way that these people who study these things, these seismologists, try to predict many times when an earthquake is going to happen because they detect foreshocks and their frequency and they measure them and that's how they predict these things. Well, what I would submit to you is that just like with the seals, the, the seven seals of the scroll in the book of Revelation, and the seven trumpets, and then the seven bowls of God's wrath, which there's no mistaking what those are about, that if you read all of the manifestations that occur with each of those phenomena, they're all somehow connected with the wrath of God being exercised against unrepentant, sinful people and there's always, in all of those instances, a corresponding earthquake that occurs somewhere along the line. Now, the point I'm getting at is, I think that reinforces the fact that those, those phenomena are really all part of the same reality and just different dimensions of the same reality. But the idea being that human history is a history of foreshocks and aftershocks that are cataloged in the book of Revelation, especially with regard to aftershocks. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, foreshocks occurred in biblical history the, a plenty in the Old Testament of your Bible. We've talked about before, and the lowest hanging fruit and the easiest one to pick on with that is the Passover when Israel was rescued out of slavery in Egypt and God, through Moses, had told the people to put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and on the sides of their door and the angel of death would pass over the houses with the blood, they had no idea, but we look back now and what do we see that as a clear enactment of? Especially since the blood was on the top of the door and the sides of the door right that was a clear foreshadowing a foreshock if you will of Jesus who would come to be the lamb of God as John the Baptist said who takes away the sin of the world now they didn't get it at the time but God was building in to human history and the history of his people Israel God was building in enacted prophecy that clearly foretold the coming of Jesus and the work that he would do to deliver people from his own wrath. And I'm submitting to you that even the events that are cataloged in the book of Revelation, whether it be through the scrolls, the trumpets, the bowls, etc., that those events are all aftershocks that will occur at some point in human history and we may not realize at the time but in retrospect we'll look back and we'll see that they're a, a, an echo as it were of Jesus' work on the cross the main event when the actual earthquake occurred when Jesus says it's finished and he gave up his spirit and he proved it by coming up out of his own grave to prove that his own wrath had been satisfied. And so, as I read the book of Revelation in this regard, I see it as four-dimensional. And what, what do you mean by that? Well, again, to reiterate, historically there have been four ways that Christians have looked at this book for 2,000 years. There's been the preterist approach. That means everything in Revelation would have happened or the things in there would have happened in the first century when it was written. Now, there's a strength in that in that the, the book is addressed to the seven churches of Asia which were existing at that time and were addressed specifically with the book. 
Furthermore, I read the other day, and I, I can't, um, I'm, I'm taking this guy's word for it. I, I can't say that I've done the math on this. But this guy was saying that, you know, the, the Antichrist, the number 666, right? The number of man. Well, if you take Nero, the emperor of Rome in the first century, toward the end of the first century, and you transliterate his name into Hebrew, and you take the Hebrew letters and you add them up, it comes up to 666. So what are the people that live then going to think? And there's been all kinds of other formulas throughout the centuries. It seems like everybody's got a manifestation of the Antichrist, and the Bible does say there are many Antichrists, little a, that are going to come, but there's a big A on the way, that type of thing. The point being that there's plenty of example in the, in the book itself to support that and the idealist view which sees all of the imagery of Revelation as symbolic or representative and not necessarily literal but representative, almost poetic in nature of other things. Augustine would have taken this approach. And again... There's some evidence for that in some of the texts, but it, it's not a blanket, a blanket way to interpret it and, and come up with some kind of a, of a conclusion that leads to a, an accurate answer. But that is present. And then there's a historicist approach, which means that it's an unfolding of human history. And I think I've just illustrated how you can see examples of that both before and after Jesus in the Bible and why would Revelation be any different? And the idea being in its prophetic emphasis. And someone once said that history is what? His story. And that's true. Jesus Christ is the ultimate human being. And all humanity is his story. It's not our story. It's not about us. It's all about Him. And I think we're going to discover that even more dramatically in eternity when we discover truth about Him that we never even realized that was happening all around us in the, in the events of human history that clearly were an echo, were an aftershock of His work. We see the ultimate example of that as an example in the futurist view of the book of Revelation which is the most common view that most people take, thinking it's all about the things that only happen at the end of time. Certainly there's legitimacy in that. In chapter 19, there's the return of Jesus. And then there's the kingdom in chapter 20 and the judgment of unrepentant sinners, the final judgment. And then there's the establishment of the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and the new earth, which reinforces the work of Jesus throughout all of creation to restore the creation. And Jesus, as the main event, reconciled all of creation to himself and started it over brand new. And, that, and that's seen in the new heaven and the new earth. As, again, earthquakes on the earth and all that as a result of the judgment, well, the other result is the transformation of even all creation. So there's clearly a futurist aspect to it. The bottom line is that the judgment that is cataloged in the seals, in the trumpets, and in the bowls, as one Bible commentator put it, the consuming passion of his holy love that wills to destroy all that is unloving and untrue. And the reason I'm drawn to that statement, back to my point earlier about understanding who God is, and the reason that statement resonated with me is years ago I was wrestling with the fact we know God is merciful, we know God is loving, we know God is good, but we also know God is just and God is holy and has, has no tolerance for rebellion or sin whatsoever. How do you reconcile those? And what a lot of people do is they... They segment, well, God is holy, and then he's just, and then he's merciful. No, God is all that he is all the time at the same time. He's never inconsistent with himself. So how do you reconcile all that? Again, it's through Jesus and that statement that the brother made, I think, 
reinforces it. When Jesus died on the cross, we see the holiness and the, the, the judgment and justice of God in that sin is judged. God has zero tolerance for sin, and sin will be judged. And Jesus, as the Lamb of God, absorbed the judgment for your sin and our sin. You sin corporately as well as individually. And our sin on the cross. But at the same time, he was manifesting the love of God because he willingly and sacrificially did that for us. So at the same time, we see the wrath of God and the sacrifice of God in giving up his own son to absorb that wrath. God is all that he is at the same time, all the time. And then, the second takeaway that I have from this passage in chapter 6, verse 12 to 17 is what we'll call a tale of two cities. Now, that is not an original phrase with me. Not only is it the title of a famous book, but it's the title of a commentary on the book of Revelation by a man who had a huge impact on me, and my relationship with him was, was very influential. Uh, and he's in heaven now, the late Dr. Robert Mulholland, and he titled his commentary on Revelation, A Tale of Two Cities. If you'll notice in chapter 16, as the bowl, we're looking at the seals in chapter 6, but in chapter 16 when we see the bowls of God's wrath clearly defined, and it says that a voice, a loud voice came from the throne when the seventh bowl was poured out, the complete wrath of God, it is done. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake occurred like no other since people have been on the earth. So great was the quake. The great city split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered in God's presence. He gave her the cup filled with the wine of his fierce anger. And chapter 17 and 18 then are the details of the overthrow of Babylon the great. And, and the idea being that notice it took the full wrath of God to destroy Babylon the Great. <coughs> and again, to reiterate, we talked about this before for those that were here, is that you always let the first reference of something in the Bible not provide the exclusive meaning of that truth, but the primary meaning, and, and then you let others be determined by the context if they're different. The first time we see Babylon in the Bible is Genesis chapter 11, is it not? Where the, where the, the Tower of Babel, where the people try to, try to build up and, hey, we're going to build a tower to the heavens and <coughs> we're going to overthrow God. So it's the cumulative sin of the human race. It's humanity together opposing God. Remember, you can sin together as well as you can individually. In fact, if you re read in Leviticus, the sacrificial system under the t uh, tabernacle in the temple, there were sacrifices not only for individual unintentional sin, but there were sacrifices for corporate unintentional sin. Together, the whole people sinning against God, and they didn't even understand it or know it. But the point that I'm getting at is that as soon as the full wrath of God is poured out, Babylon the Great, which again, primary reference, it's the whole sin of humanity, not sins plural, but sin singular, as, as a reality in the human psyche, the disease with which everyone is infected and is deadly, that sin is destroyed. So what I see in chapter 17 and 18 is proof, because it's clearly a reference to Jesus being crucified, is what we call holiness or sanctification. I see that in chapter 17 and 18 in spades. Because Babylon the Great has been destroyed. The corporate sin, the sin of humanity, has been stripped of its power 
by the blood of Jesus. And now we can have the power to walk with him freely and have victory to be released not just from the penalty for sin, but the power for, of sin. And that truth, amen, and that truth is, is, is embedded within the text. You see, the destruction of Babylon the Great resulted in the establishment of the New Jerusalem. Because what comes on the heels of Babylon the Great is the New Jerusalem. You start out in the Isle of Patmos, and then you end up in the New Jerusalem in the New Heaven and New Earth. That's where the book starts and the book ends. It's a tale of two cities, the destruction of Babylon the Great, so that the New Jerusalem can be built. And that New Jerusalem is a place of holiness and purity, and the only thing that can cure that is the full wrath of God. And it was poured out on Jesus at the cross. The greatest expression of God's wrath was the crucifixion of his son. The full wrath of God was measured on him at that moment for the whole human race. And then the last takeaway that I want to emphasize is what I want to call facial recognition. Now that's a phenomenon that I'd say everybody in this room is, not everybody maybe, but most of us in this room are pretty familiar with because you got a phone that recognizes your face sometimes <laughs> and if you want I mean I don't know I've never thought of it but maybe it'd be fun to kind of squint your face up and see if you can fool it you know <laughs> try to look like somebody else I don't know but that's a, a modern phenomenon isn't it but I think it's an apt title for what else we discover when this sixth seal is opened. And what we see is that verses 12 through 14 of chapter 6 are talking about some of those aftershocks, the, the judgment of God and the consequences of that judgment are seen in verses 15 through 17, consequences for the people who are exposed to it. And I think it's fascinating. And to introduce and to discuss that, I'm going to show a picture that I pulled off my phone that we got back in December. This is a picture of, um, of one of my son-in-laws back in December standing at the, the rim of a volcano in Hawaii. And he and my daughter went down there. They found a place in Hawaii that gave a really good rate for military uh, people to, to stay and they, they spent about four days in Hawaii and evidently there was a volcano near where they stayed so they hiked up to the volcano. Now, I'm going to tell you something. This is far closer to a volcano than I would ever be comfortable being. <laughs> right? And, and, and um, if you notice, it actually looks like a lake in the middle of the thing but it's actually not. That's all cooled magma. It's just hard rock of the cooled magma from the collapse of the volcano and it's still spewing out some stuff there and all like that and you know a, a, a volcano is a very frightening uh, thing in fact how many of you ever been to Yosemite National Park <laughs> you ever been there did you <laughs> this is an inside there's some people that make fun of me because I was at Yosemite for the first time a couple years ago and two days after I got there I made the statement you know, I think this thing is a volcano. And everybody looks, where have you been? <laughs> this has been like two days. Where, what planet are you on? And so uh, if you ever want to know about vol volcanology, just ask Glenn Jacobs, a member of our church. Glenn will you know, teach you all about volcanoes. He, he straightened me out. But, that, but anyway, I'm thinking, you know, that whole park is a volcano. I didn't understand that. It took me a few days after being there to understand that. But what about you? Did you know? I mean, you think about that. I mean, what kind of vacation is that in the middle of a volcano? <laughs> I mean, that's not, that's, not, that's not wise nor safe. And, you know, they keep talking about that thing, about it, you know, can you imagine if that thing blew up? My goodness. And you can see all the spewing it's got now all over the place. But... 
Volcanoes, in my opinion, are terrifying things. At least the things I see on TV. I, you know, you see the things they're looking over the edge and they're testing. I'm going, why are these people doing that? You know, that's crazy. You fall off that thing. I mean, it's one thing to die. It's another thing to die that way, right? <laughs> In the middle of a fall. <laughs> it's just terrifying. But, but the reality is that when we come to, to verses 15 through 17, and it's kind of hard to separate earthquakes from volcanoes in my mind because they all kind of go together, right? Look at what it says again. Then the kings of the earth, the nobles, the generals, the rich, the powerful, and every slave and free person. Now, this is covering all humanity. This is not just... This is everybody. It is the old saying, the ground's level at the foot of the cross. This covers all of unrepentant human, humanity. Hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb because the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand notice whose wrath it is it's their wrath it's God the Father and God the Son you know that reinforces the truth that Jesus says in John chapter 5 that, he, that the, God the Father is not going to judge anybody Jesus is going to be the judge of every human being according to Jesus because he is the son of man because he became a human being Jesus is going to judge every human I mean nobody can say to Jesus well you never you don't get it <laughs> he was tempted in every way as we are yet without sin and God the father has made him the judge and Jesus therefore according to Jesus and according it's reinforced here in Revelation 6 he's not only the person that's going to send people to heaven he's the person that's going to send everybody to hell that's going to go to hell and he's offering heaven and sacrificially offered that now. So I'll, I don't want to make him mad. I'll take Jesus now. But notice that these people who are unrepentant would prefer to have a mountain fall on them than have to see the face of God. It was safer to have a mountain fall on you than to see the face of God. I read one Bible commentator who said this, only the dissolution of the world will sink tremor in the heart of man in the last days, end of quote. And respectfully, I disagree with that statement because this passage says that it's more frightening for the unrepentant sinner to see God than it is to have a mountain fall on you. The dissolution of the earth is not nearly as frightening as having to face God without Jesus Christ. I, I could say a whole lot more about that, and I will later on as we get into later in the year preaching on um, the principles of faith that we have but I'll say this that and I'll close with this thought that unrepentant people whether they be rich and powerful or poor and powerless would prefer to be destroyed by a mountain falling on them than to have to see the face of God God's face for someone outside of Christ is more dangerous than the middle of a volcano. I will stick with Jesus, thank you.